like to end with one of our most recent women in history, and Rachel Carson. some of you have read uh, in your English classes. My name is Rachel Louise Carson. I was born May 27, 1907. I am called a naturalist, and a naturalist is an old-fashioned way to say biologist. This is what they used to call biologists back in the day. They used to call them naturalists, and we studied the natural world. My childhood was very pleasant. Um, I loved to read. My mother was an avid reader. She taught me to read and write. I loved to write as well. And I used to write books even back when I was uh, 10 years old. And I loved writing so much that I decided that uh, I was going to go to college and become a writer. But I also really liked science too. Because when I was a kid, my mother used to take us out hiking and we would go collect things. See, back in the early 1900s or even the late 1800s, being a naturalist was a hobby for people. So they used to, middle class people would go out and, and especially women, would go and collect leaves and bring them back and label them and collect them or shells or acorns or whatever they found on hikes. They would bring back and label them and learn about them and that was a hobby for people back at the turn of the century. And so that's what my mother did, and that's what she taught us to do, and I really loved nature as well. So I went off to college, I went to the Pennsylvania College for Women, which is now called Chapman College, and I went there to study to be a writer, but I really liked science, and so I changed my major, and I got a major in biology. After that, I studied the Woods Hole uh, Marine Biology Laboratory, and then I went to Johns Hopkins University, and I got a Master's of Art in Zoology. How many of you know a woman scientist or a woman science teacher? Okay. Well, it's really common now, but back in the 1930s, when I graduated from Johns Hopkins, it was not common at all. There were not a lot of women scientists and not a lot of women science teachers. And this was very unusual. Well, I was hired by the U.S. Bureau of Fisheries to do writing, actually. So I got to combine writing and I got to combine science together, and I really liked that. So I was in charge of the radio scripts. So whatever the scientists were doing in the U.S. Bureau of Fisheries, I would write the scripts and then they would put them on the radio. And I'd make pamphlets and stuff like that. And I was the editor-in-chief. So that was a very um, high job for a woman at the time. In my spare time, I used to go down to type pools. I lived by the ocean, and I'd go and collect a bunch of stuff with a friend of mine. And so we'd bring back stuff from tide pools to a little cottage. Uh, like what? What's in a tide pool? Fish. Not frogs. <laughs> Sometimes fish. What else? What's in a tide pool? <laughs> sea stars. <laughs> sea urchins. <laughs> crabs. Alright, so I'd collect them in buckets, and I'd bring them back to a cottage, and I'd draw them, and I'd observe them, and I'd write about them, and then, before they died, I'd went and I'd go put them back, because I didn't really want to kill them. And so, uh, eventually, I had so much data that I wrote a book, and it became a bestseller, and it won prizes, and it was called The Sea Around Us in 1952. Now, how many of you love nature shows? Like, you watch Discovery Channel, and you love, like, Animal Planet, not, well, Animal Planet, and Planet Earth, and all of those stuff, I mean, things like monster fish, okay. Well, back in the 1950s, do you know most people didn't have a TV? And if they did have a TV, it wasn't in color, it was black and white, and it was only three channels, or if you're lucky. So people didn't have all of these cool shows that you guys get to watch now to learn about nature. They actually had to read books to learn about nature. And so my book became a bestseller because I wrote it 
really nicely and people liked the way I wrote and they liked the illustrations and that's how they actually learned about nature was from my books. And so I became a popular author. I wrote The Sea Around Us in 1952 and The Edge of the Sea in 1955. When people met me or saw me um, on an interview, they were actually surprised that a woman wrote about the sea and that I was actually an attractive woman that wrote about the sea because they just didn't think those things went together. Uh, a lot of prejudice back then. In 1952, I resigned from the government service uh, to take care of my nephew whose mother had died. And I told lots of nature stories to children and I like to write for children. But I also became real concerned about something else that was going on in nature. There was a lot of industrial chemicals that had come out around World War II. And one was called DDT. And DDT was considered a really, really great chemical because World War II was the first war that more soldiers died from the war than from disease. Because before this, if you went off to war, the Civil War or World War I or the Revolutionary War, and you were in a camp with a bunch of dirty men, guess what? You had more chance of dying from catching a disease like typhus from body lice or cholera from bad water, or malaria from mosquitoes. You had more chance of dying from that than actually from getting shot out in war. And so DDT was one of those chemicals they used to spray all over the soldiers to kill body lice, to not to spread typhus, to kill mosquitoes in the South Pacific so that it wouldn't spread malaria. And it was considered a really great thing because it saved a lot of lives. And it did, it saved a lot of lives. So they used to take this chemical after World War II and they sprayed it all over everywhere. So can you imagine if you walk into school and this plane flies over and sprays you with chemicals? They weren't trying to get you, what were they trying to get? Bugs, yeah. So bugs in people's yards and golf courses and parks and the woods and stuff like that. They tried to control something called the gypsy moth, which was an invasive species that was killing trees. So they would just spray everybody's houses and lawns and even if you didn't want it, you would still get sprayed. And the, some bad stuff had started happening in nature. I had a friend named Olga Huggins in 1957 who wrote me, she had a bird sanctuary. And a plane came over and sprayed DDT all over the whole town. And her bird sanctuary, all these birds just died. They were writhing and they died. And she was really mad because it's a bird sanctuary to like try and keep them, protect them and keep them alive. And you know, she didn't want this spraying, but it, she had really no choice. So she encouraged me to look into this, so I did. So I took all of this research that other scientists were doing, and I spent a few years compiling it all together, and I wrote a book called Silent Spring, which was about the dangers of DDT and other uh, pesticides. I found out that they were killing your top predatory birds, like the bald eagle, like what else? It's another one. Osprey, good, what else? Not the ostrich. <laughs> Peregrine falcon. Brown pelican. Good. AP Bible Science students, you're supposed to know this. Okay. So what happens is that the DDT makes the shells weak in the birds. So the mama bird goes to sit on the nest, and the eggs crack, and the baby birds die. And so you don't have any baby birds, which means that your species can decline in number. And it became endangered. So all those species became endangered because of DDT. So Science Spring taught about this. And the chemical industry hated me. They were so upset. They thought I was a hysterical woman and that I was completely wrong. And how could all of their chemical scientists be right or be wrong and I was right? So they spent a million dollars fighting me my publishing company, Houghton Mifflin, and the New Yorker magazine that runs some of my book. And because they spent so much money fighting it, it actually became really popular. Everybody's like, wow, cool, let's see what she has to say. So uh, it became a bestseller. So now Set Up Spring, which I have down here, is translated into 22 languages. You guys read it sometimes for your English classes. And uh, I was uh, called in by Congress to testify in 1963. So I went to Congress and I told them what was happening and Congress believed me and they banned DDT as well as a couple of other really bad chemicals. I was also credited for starting the modern environmental movement. 
which is still going on today, and for promoting the start of the Environmental Protection Agency, which is called the EPA. Sadly, I didn't get to see a lot of the success of my book or of the banning of these chemicals because I died in 1964 at the age of 57 from breast cancer. Thank you very much.